Okay, uh, hi everyone, welcome to ArtsFest Online. This evening we will be joining writer RM Francis for a talk and workshop on Black Country Geopoetics. As well as being a published author, Rob lectures in creative writing at the University of Wolverhampton. Over to you, Rob. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, so yeah, uh, my name's Rob Francis. Uh, I'm a poet and a writer. I'm one of the creative and professional writing lecturers. And at the moment, uh, I've got the great honour of being the poet in residence for the Black Country Geological Society. So I'm working my way around uh, the different geo sites uh, that are all connected with the, the, the wider geo, uh, geo park project. Uh, many of you may know that uh, the, the Black Country Geo Park has recently been awarded UNESCO status for its geological significance, which is brilliant for the region and brilliant for all the people that have worked on it. Um, so what I want to do this evening is uh, take you through some of my ideas as uh, poet in residence um, and uh, run a very quick writing workshop with you as well. Uh, and that's what we're going to start with, actually. Well, it's going to be uh, bookending my little kind of ramble about uh, geo. So what I want you all to start with, uh, I want you to get some pens and paper in front of you or, or uh, something to write with at least. And what I want you to do is think of your favourite green space or wild space. Uh, there'll be extra house points for people that think of salt wells or the Renner or uh, Sedgley Beacon or anything that's connected with Black Country geo sites. Um, it could be a park, it could be a nature reserve, it could be a woodland. Uh, something that you know well, really, something that you can picture quite nice and, and clearly in your mind. Uh, and once you've got that place settled and you can start thinking about it and sort of conjuring it up in your heads, I want you to make a word list for me to start with. I want you to list three sensory words, so things that you can see, smell, taste, hear. I want you to list three emotions or moods or memories that you associate with this place. Uh, I want you to list three things that are below your feet if you were in this site, things that are underneath your feet. And then things that you might find underground. So that's three sensory items, three emotions, moods or memories, three words for things that are at feet level or just under your feet. And then three things that you might find underneath ground. And have a think through that. And as you're making that word list, have a little think about the connections between the words. And they might be thematic connections or just words that sound nice and interesting and there's a kind of sonic quality that you like between them as well. And if there's anything else that pops into your head that you think is interesting, then get that noted down as well. Part of this kind of warm up is to destroy the blank page and bring all those idiosyncratic thoughts to the front of your minds. And as you're doing that, I'm going to uh, give you a little sort of, well, I guess it's, it's somewhere in between a, a, a talk and a lecture um, on geopoetics and some of my thoughts as poet in residence for the Black Country Geological Society. So here goes. Geopoetics are a variety of experimental writing practices that draw on geological method and language and consider human life, culture and society in a deep time context. The Canadian poet Don McKay referred to it as the place where materialism and mysticism those ancient enemies finally come together, have a conversation in which each hearkens to the other, then go out for a drink. So in this way, the poet's notebook and the geologist's field journal fuse. This is about deeply 
connecting to the land and its primal histories and considering ourselves in the context of its deep time awe. It's also about finding new ways of meditating on and communicating about place, who we are, where we're arriving at and from, what building materials give us life and meaning. The eco-poet Derek Sheffield notes the connections between ecology and poetry, suggesting that the notebook becomes a field journal. He says that we've got Adam's task, thinking of the right name for a thing. In naming them, we give them spirit, epistemological, narrative, and poetic spirit. Like Uncle Oscar Wilde said, nothing existed until art invented it. For Sheffield, following the trail in ecology is the same as following the strange impulse and tides of a poem and a poem in progress, an intellectual and physical wayfinding. Drafting equates to evolution and the development of a scientific method. Here, the poetics of the creative are informed by the language, processes and observations of the sciences. And through this, the poet comes to recognize in their uh, poetics, a community of sensory data, of vernaculars and interrelationships. And that's the same as ecology, a community of species and connecting interactions. And in this, we get a recognition of connectedness and otherness. We're part of the system and yet separate observers. So the other connected is as integral to science as it is to poetry. It's the other and the same together. And this is what's possible with geopoetics, the observation of millennia long bonds and gulfs. And one of the most significant figures in geopoetics is Kenneth White, who wrote, I had always been of the persuasion that the richest poetics came from contact with the earth, from a plunge into biospheric space, from an attempt to read the lines of the world. Going on to argue, that this can be done in two ways, either by archeological work on a language or by an exotic recourse to other languages with different metaphysics, different initial fictions. In simple terms then, what we're looking for here is a language mine, a collecting of words and terms that offer these different illuminating potentials. But there's more at play too, as White says, it's a liberation from our conditioned minds. Once outside, you let things be, you let go. And he says that letting be isn't a psychological context. It's an ontological one. It's one about being. And you retrieve, he says, a topological presence. And this presence is achieved through acute geological and deep time observations. And this takes us back to McKay. Geopoetry, he says, makes it legitimate for the natural historian or scientist to speculate or gawk, and equally legitimate for the poet to, be, to benefit from the close observation and some of the amazing facts that science turns up. It provides a crossing point, a bridge over the infamous gulf separating scientific and poetic frames of mind, a gulf that has not served us well, nor the planet we inhabit with so little reverence or grace. And this is the foundation of my project, the Chain Coral Chorus. And since the black country is so rich, richly steeped in geological wonder, it makes sense to further the geopoetry projects in unearthing things that are available on my doorstep. My previous work like Bella and my poetry pamphlets, I've spent quite a lot of time thinking about the black country's liminal qualities the marginal, unmappable, off-kilter landscapes and cultures that become symbolically charged spaces in my work. Part of this is how communities and cultures exist and express in post-industrial contexts. The connections between industry and community and between industrial community and geology are really important and fascinating intellectual pathways. Um, it's not just the geological significance of the region that enables these poetics, it's the gorgeous, slippery nature of the region as well. 
the slippery nature of black countryness that mirrors the slippery nature of geopoetics. You see, the black country is not quite north and not quite south. It's a strange mix of green and grey space. Much of the culture is based on our industrial past, but this heritage has been ruined, renovated and built over. It sits in the shadow of its more successful brother Birmingham, but we're definitely not Brummies. We've got our own flag, set of dialects, recognisable cultural artefacts and spaces and pe people, but none of us can really define uh, or settle on where the black country begins and ends. This, coupled with its post-industrial position, means that the landscape and the spirit of place is one of marginality and liminality. The things we do know for sure, or at least imagine for sure, is that the black country identity and spaces are bound up in forges, steelworks, glassworks, nail makers, chain makers, what was called the cradle of the industrial revolution. And what's also clear is that all of this was enabled by the coal seams and the rich mineral resources in the region. These grounds, like the chain coral, built webs of housing estates, workers' institutes, pubs and religious places, solid communal chain links, solid and lost, another in between, like the geology that's just below the surface. And I think that these overlooked liminal grounds are ripe for entering and re-entering to bring about that topographic reverie that Kenneth White discusses and to look into building Don McKay's poetic crossing point. The geosites in the Black Country are exemplars of this. These are lands where we might lose our footing, both literally and imaginatively. They're beautiful, rich havens of the natural, but if you know where and how to look, their liminal qualities come to the fore as well. Here we have prehistoric relics resting, ammonite, sea lily, locked in fossil time traps. Time and space changes can be mapped in the varves, lines and layers of coloured rocks that pierce through the grounds and form valleys and cliffs. Stare for long enough at wren's nest ripple beds and you're rushed with awe in realising and physically touching and sensing that this land was once an ocean. These relics humble us. The industrial past can muster similar sensations. Ruins of engine houses, railway lines and mine shafts are everywhere in the geopark. Eerie in their new setting, they're absent from the sensory uh, and communal things associated with them. Weird in their newly rewilded home. They're off kilter, out of place and out of time. And again, investigating the heritage in these sites gives us a sense of connectedness to our forebears and ancestors. It provides a deeper understanding and connection to the modernity and mundaneity that surrounds places like Barrow Hill or Bookpool. What we've got in these spaces is a primordial lineman between prehistory, industry, and our everyday realms. And this lyman is embedded with wild roots. They're home to rare species of newt, dragonfly, and flower, places for dog walks and family picnics, bird watching and conservation. The untamed natural has returned to the rich geotopography and taken back that which once plundered it. And all this layering of different ghosts and growths are set against domestic life. Saltwell's nature reserve is orbited by Netherton's housing estate to Merry Hill Shopping Centre. So these places that hold so much symbolic and scientific treasure that connect us to the earth and our history do so on the doorsteps of our everyday realms. Take West Park in Wolverhampton. Here you'll find huge glacial erratics pitched in the park grounds like ancient totems. They've traveled hundreds of miles during the glacial epoch and are even older than that. It's a poignant reminder of the toddlerdom of humanity on earth. You can touch this piece of ancient movements exactly where kids play football, where dog walkers and joggers circulate, and just minutes from Wolverhampton's bustle. 
Similar thing can be said about Hayes cutting. Uh, a fascinating dipping sequence took behind a rusted rail on the industrial estates of the lie. Commuters, deliveries, school runs, all zip past as, as it sits in its almost invisibility. There's something atavistic in these sites or something that summons or imbues atavism. And I don't mean this in any negative way. I, I see it as a touchstone for reconnecting with our locales, lands and the earth in a deep time context and with the tactile knowledge that runs down to the oldest parts of our biology. This I think is what White talks about when he says the geopoetist is immediately placed in the enormous or when another geopoetist, uh, geopoetist Francis Ponge said they sink into the night of Logos until finally they find themselves at the root level where things and formulations merge. On another line, George Amar thought about embodied knowledge and reading the land. He said reading is like swimming or dancing. Eskimos can read the snow and nomads desert sand. These are things that we can walk through, touch, see and smell. And in that, that connect us to our region and our land in ways that are both intellectual and visceral. It's like ancient wayfinding skills, embodied and physical wisdom. So it seems that totem is exactly the right word for West Park's erratics. And I'd use it for the other geological cuttings and features across the region too. The totem is that which with a strange sense of animism calls and connects people and place. What we get here then is a, a series of rhizomes of place identity markers, fossil, bluebell, bell pits and terraced house, all share space, caught in a beautiful in-between. Place identity is a term used for the ways we attach ourselves to our locales. Places are packed full of different things, smells, sounds, memories, activities, movements, people, artifacts, all site specific which the subject takes into their sense of self, places fundamental to selfhood. The bottom line of that is the land, the makeup of the rocks and soils that allow all of these things to bloom. And in recognizing this, we're awestruck at our mutual connectedness, as well as our grand insignificance. This is a, a post-industrial sublime in a Gothic and romantic sense. And just being there, gaining what White called a topological presence is inspiring. But dig into the earth, search out your own Dudley bug, and you're in a state of reverence, wonderment, joy, and terror. Simon Armitage, who's one of my first poetry crushes, uh, spoke about literature's relationship with geography and earth sciences, suggesting that the story and the poem are sort of cousins to geography, since in British literature, uh, a sense of place and a sense of geography permeates pretty much everything and that geography and landscape characterise it. Once you learn even just a little about the makeup of the terrains in which we live, it's impossible just to see a hill, a grass verge, a housing estate. They become carefully orchestrated, even poetic things. These things often passed at speed and without deliberation when moving through the mundane, become corries, glaciofluval sands, meltwater ridges, sites centered around ancient religious and cultural symbols, social patterns that mirror their geological histories. This is Rambodian. The poet becomes the seer by the prodigious rational disordering of the senses. It's a rewakening, refinding, refining, renaming of the familiar. And these become or are brought into being by the seer as things of movement and narrative. I understand this as a form or at least a fundamental element to geopoetics, a search for the known, bringing about the unknown and using that to exfoliate, to use a geological term, one's modernity blinkered perceptions of the world. It's a return to the earth, but returning in Rambo's drunken boat. 
for this Black Country Geopoetics, for my role as poet in residence for the Black Country Geological Society and the Chain Coral Chorus, it's necessary to get deeper and to go deeper to try to find the bedrock of place into geology. As such, this delving into the heritage of rocks and layers of land provides a deep time and long wave context to our understanding of place, what Kenneth White said, topographic reverie. So I'm making the geo in geopoetics geological, in a sense to get to the foundation stone of place from where it all grew. In this, digging deep, as deep as a poet can, physically and symbolically, and harnessing its yield to the patterns of contemporary black country place identity, as wild and as simple as that might be. This reconfiguring of the everyday and fusion of different ways of seeing as roots towards geopoetic awe is shared by another important figure in the field, Norman Bissell, and I'm going to let him have the last word. He said, it's about a poetic approach to the world by way of sharpening our senses, being more acutely sensitive to our surroundings, developing a well-grounded creative response to everything around us. Writing poems, yes, but also walking hills, exchanging ideas, cutting peat, making maps, washing dishes. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed that and I didn't go too quickly. Uh, um, this is going to be recorded anyway, so fingers crossed everyone can kind of look back on it if you need to anyway. Um, so with that in mind and hopefully ideas full and fresh with geopoetics, uh, I'd like to uh, move back to our writing workshop. And what we're going to do is write a very simple imagist poem together. Um, and it's only five lines long, but you can add to this in your own time and you can keep adding five lines in different formats uh, and building up a kind of sequence. If anyone out there has got things that they want to share with me, I'd be very keen to see them uh, as part of this project. You can email me on r.francis at wlv.ac.uk. Um, and if I like what I see, uh, I'll put it on my blog. Um, but anyway, let's crack on with the writing. So it's five lines. Your first line is just going to be one word. And I want it to be one of the words that you listed at the beginning of today's session that you find underground or at feet level. Just one word. Something that you found at feet level or, or possibly below the earth. Line two is going to be two sensory words. So line two is only two words long. And it's two of your sensory words that you listed at the beginning. Line three will be three of your emotions or moods or memories. And again, just three words. Line four is going to get slightly more complicated in that it's got more words. Uh, but also, uh, I want you to kind of try and form it into some sort of sentence rather than a word list, which is what we've been doing so far. I want you to write just in four words. A brief sentence about your state of presence or awe that you might find yourself in this place. So what's on, what state of mind have you got to in this place? And then your final line is back to one word. And that one word needs to be a synonym 
or an alternative word or maybe a more poetic uh imagistic word for the first word that you used in this poem so a synonym for one of this one of the the things that you noticed on the earth or underneath the ground i'll run through that very quickly again so line one is one word something that you found underground or at feet level line two is two words two sensory words something that you smell taste look at here line three are three separate emotions three words emotions moods or a memory line four is much more of a sentence but only in four words about presence about the state of mind about deep time or being in awe at something and then finally you're back to one word again in your final line which would be an alternative synonym uh, or potentially more poetic word for your initial line and once you've done that what you should have is a cinquain or a cinquain i'm never really sure how to pronounce it it's called a didactic cinquain um you can do very similar poems with syllable counts rather than word counts um and you can also make really beautiful patterns out of your poems with them as well by uh doing reverse cinquains or mirror cinquains and creating on the page a sort of various diamond effects or uh sort of spider web effects or honeycomb effects uh if you were to write several sequence uh, a sequence of these as well and it strikes me that the the form itself lends itself to this sort of fossil geological exploration to just the way that the lines slowly take us down into something and then rest somewhere uh, so there hopefully form and content should be working together as well um and that's your writing exercise and like i say i'd be absolutely thrilled if people got in touch with me uh, to share what you've done um and uh maybe we can get some uh guest poems up on my up on my chain choral chorus blog um before uh we move into uh, whether or not people have got any questions for me or uh want me to reiterate anything or whatever um i'm going to read some poems that i've been writing over the last few months so this is hot off the press out of the residency uh a few poems that i've been working on since uh june uh and again that I've, I've already explained most of my kind of motivations and thought processes behind these uh so i won't blabber on too much for you uh this first poem is called coalescence just spring the last leaves left from autumn's mulching leak into pig iron grounds, gray whack, fire clay, iron stone, sit turbid at Netherton Spa, where dog walkers and rambling clubs and pinfold teens and locked in pensioners sense the spectral gravity beneath feet. It seems to whine at the fly tipped waist, it takes it into itself and the buds from bramble damson wipe room from eyes between quick flash of bluebell snowdrop room drips in dalton caverns as in weeping elms and human paws this land leaves them colloidal we suspend thank you very much uh, one of the things that uh, geologists and uh, poets that are interested in geology 
are also interested in is time. It's not just about the lay of the land. It's what it's, uh, it's what the rocks and the changes in the rocks tell us about um, time and space. Um, and uh, again, I think this is another sort of way of getting to that sense of reverie uh, and sublime sense of awe uh, that you can find in mountains and lakes and indeed if you're looking looking into the earth as well um one of those um one of those methods of measuring time is called stratigraphic time which is a brilliant word um and it's the title of this next poem stratigraphic time ground frost sits shaded before May Day rays thaw, and we use its silver shimmer like fisherman trails through fence, follow hawthorn nook, cowslip cause, iced pebble mass to great bar fault, where Brecher forges god time in red rock displacements. At the stratifold, I'm taken between dimensions to steaming swamp forests, flittering with glitter bubbles of squirming chilopoda. Its curl speaks the same song as bracken, chain corals infinite coda. Then home, now frosts are mellowed and circuits and circles and stirrings clasp everything. Thank you very much. Let me scroll down my page. Um, as I mentioned at the top of this talk, um, the Black Country Geopark uh, recently uh, got awarded uh, after a, a long campaign, uh, a long successful campaign, um, got awarded with uh, UNESCO status as a region, as a, as a, a very wide uh, geopark, as a network of different geo sites. Uh, for its geological significance and because of the role that that geological significance played in uh, our industrial pasts uh, as well. Um, and part of the work that's ongoing now, I mentioned in my talk that uh, these, these sites of, uh, these post-industrial sites are now like lush, gorgeous, protected nature reserves with all sorts of beauty in them uh, and unusual beauty as well. Um, so much of the work of the Black Country Geological Society and the people involved in the Black Country Geo Park um, are about trying to get more people interested in this sort of thing and get people uh, out to these park, to these sites encouraging sustainable tourism and I guess ecological tourism as well. Um, one of the main people involved in this, uh, in the project uh, and uh, is the chairman of the Geological Society is Graham Wharton um, and uh, he's a, uh, a phenomenal uh, intelligent man uh, whose grasp of black country history is as uh, profound as his grasp of uh, geology. Um, and so this poem is for him, uh, even though I'm yet to meet him in person. It's called Keeper of Geology. Pedestrians pass Graham, unblinking in stone stepped strides, anagogical gaze, calm smile, with push chairs armed with market loot. Taking rest at Duncan Edwards' feet, he works down Broadway, pocket readied with loop, field notes, clinometer. Graham, here's the sounds of Dudley. Seven legged wyvern props our streets with upturned feet. 300 ton foundations harmonized from Wenlock. Guards thin grain preservation of Silurian soft tissues. Graham says, it's geology's holy grail. Sirens, passengers through cathedral arch, portals to Little Tess, 
hearsed, singing cavern, float slow and mute, keep it on its back, spy aragonite vaults that gape and bear Castle Hill. Graham cuts Tipton Road, taps toe every few feet, listening for echoes under tarmac. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to leave you with uh, one more and then we'll uh, see if anybody has any questions for me. Um, again, I mentioned that uh, these geo sites are um, home to protected and endangered species. Uh, and just around the corner from me, I live on uh, I live in the Wren's Nest. So the Renner is the, the closest one, uh, closest geo site to me. And it, it is the best part of the black country. Um, it's an objective truth. Uh, but just up the road from me is Cotwell End and the Straits, which are, are almost as good as the Renner. Um, and there is home to uh, some beautiful newts. Uh, I went walking there uh, while lockdown was at its height, really. Um, and so it was beautifully quiet and, and everything was so sunny and, and gorgeous, starting to kind of come out of the ponds there. Um, and, and on the back of that, I sort of wrote this poem. It's called Efts. Um, those are Efts are a sort of toddler newts. Tick track, oval through Orthorn by fate foraging for gorn or fish in gorn or grit. That's how you'll lose your jawbone, me wench, with gawping gob. Silica sands sit cool beneath bone bed, Turner's bunk. This track, eh, for tackle trepsers and sedge seekers. Here you need geo patience. Here's the fault. A boundary fault in boundaryless lees. The straits and cockwell ends release. Tech the Forty newts pulled up there, on standing to tail wave, each egg leaf wrapped, larvae trans to F trans to Titan since Eocene. Tech track oval through Orthorn to heath, wood, grassland, brook, pool, then spring. You wonder where you am, protolith lost in foliation thank you very much uh, i really hope everybody's enjoyed this and found it interesting um i welcome any feedback because as i say this is a, a project that's ongoing um i should also say a really big thank you to the university of wolverhampton's doctoral college uh because had it not been for the early research award scheme uh this none of this will have been uh, able to take place. Um, so I'll uh, open it up to you guys whether you have any questions, but thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Rob. Yep, there are a few questions. Um, so the first one is from yeah. Kerry Bradley Price. Hello, Kerry. Um, as a poet, how much of your engagement with geology has encouraged you to feel, feel out the presence of the place in a different way? Uh, Hi, hi, Kerry. It's lovely to know you're there. Um, oh, my phone's starting to slip. I apologise for that. I'll have to put my hand there. Um, yeah, it's 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 been really fascinating. I have to say, Kerry, it's, it's been really, really interesting. Um, and it has it's. I wouldn't say it's completely changed my perception of the Black Country, because I was all um, because I, I guess in the back of my head, I knew this. I knew that what was there was there anyway and I knew that uh, I was al already aware that it you know if it wasn't for the limestone and the fossil rich grounds then those networks of communities wouldn't have wouldn't have happened either um, and that, that does creep into some of my earlier work and, and, and does with Bella as well um, but uh, now that I'm starting to kind of get to grips with um, the way the makeup of the land looks and what that means has has altered my perceptions of of where I'm going and what I'm looking at. Whereas 
previously I would go for a walk around Saltwells or uh, up and down Sedgley Beacon or something. I'd be I'd be focusing mainly on the the industrial relics there, so the quarries and the bell pits and things like that. Whereas now I'm sort of nerding out on the change in uh, the texture and colours of the rocks. Um, so I I guess I'm I'm zooming in. That's what it feels like poetically. I'm 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 zooming in. Uh, uh, in a magnified way uh, but it also feels like I'm entering a separate world as well it also feels like I'm although I'm still very much connected to the black country and my work is still very much connected to sort of place identity um, there's a sense that I'm I'm going into a different dimension of it as well and of course it's a long forgotten time isn't it where humans didn't exist so in a in a sense it is a different dimension Hopefully that's answered your question. It's lovely to know you're listening though, Kerry. Thanks, Kerry. Um, okay, this one's from Josie Ann Boutonet. Uh, she asks, would you say that poetry is a useful medium for raising awareness about the importance of geology today? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and it is something that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, I, I suppose, for, for a lot of people geology is a bit of a uh, has a perception of being quite dry um um and unsexy i guess um but that's not really the case um because it, it is really exciting and, and like i said in my talk it, it it allows you to kind of start looking at the everyday with wonder in lots of ways um but I think what poetry offers many subjects, not just geology um, or, or the earth sciences, but it does tend to work particularly well with geology and the earth sciences because they're, there's, it, you, you've got such a rich uh, encyclopedia of words and terms and methods that you can draw on. Um, but what I, I get in lots of ways what I look to do when I'm writing my poems is to to bring disparate elements together, things that wouldn't necessarily connect together uh, and try and form something new out of them. It's it's, a, it's an old idea, really. It, it, I'm, I'm stealing it from T.S. Eliot um, and his ideas of kind of forming conjugations out of the old and the new. Um, uh, but that does seem to. To, to lend itself particularly well to, to the earth sciences in the sense that what we're looking at is uh, the physics, the chemistry, the biology of the land, uh, but with an injection of kind of um, social uh, and, and human spirit as well. That sounds very grand. Hopefully that's answered your question. Thank you, Josie Ann. There's another one from Josie Ann. Uh, question two, how many black country dialect words have you used in your geopoetics? Uh, how many black country? Um, a handful, I would say. I mean, I don't know off the top of my head. I've got about 20. I've got about 25 poems written so far, um, 20 of them that I'm pretty pleased with. Uh, and I tend to use dialect in my work sparingly, I suppose, N not so much with my with my prose, but definitely with my poetry. So the dialect, when I use it, tends to be um, used in it as a as a poetic device in the same way that other poets would use assonance or alliteration. <clears throat> just because I think it's beautiful in lots of ways and because I want to kind of preserve it um, and uh, I think it helps to especially when I'm talking about quite abstract things or quite or things that are quite difficult to to process um, it's useful to use dialect in that way to kind of um, to, to put a time space stamp on it so it's definitely of a particular era definitely of a particular place and that somehow makes it kind of anchored. Um, 
but uh, in the main, I mean, <clears throat> I'll, I'll occasionally use those really old words like bibble, uh, those really beautiful old black country words. But generally, I mean, it's, it's more about uh, the black country rhythm and peculiar grammar than it is about the words themselves, I think. Okay, thanks for that, Josiane. Um, so this one's from Daisy Black. She said, oh, I loved your idea of the toddlerism of humanity. Is our attempt to interact with the mm. land through poetry a childlike act too? Uh, my two-year-old friend is going through uh, a what does mud taste like phase. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's definitely how I feel. And I, I've taken my daughter on quite a lot of these walks with me as well. Um, and, and several of the poems that have that have worked their way through have been about that childlike um, wonderment of trying to connect with the earth. So there's, there's definitely a sense that um, what I'm attempting to do, and I think what are the geopoetic writers and thinkers have attempted to do is to try and um, clear the experience from your eyes to, to, to sort of paraphrase William Blake, to kind of clear that, clear all the mud of the everyday and, and, and your mature adulthood away and look at things fresh. And having children around you really helps to do that because they look at grass and go oh my god it's grass that's incredible and you go yeah it is pretty incredible that that's still there after like the 20th century and all of the all that we've done to the earth um so uh yeah that's how i feel anyway daisy okay thanks daisy uh this one from anna Bedo. This has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you. What text would you recommend as a way into geo poetry? Oh, um, there's loads out there actually. Um, if you, I mean, I'm 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 quite obsessed with Kenneth White at the moment. Um, he's been writing since the sort of sixties. Um, there is um, geo poetry twenty. Only happened last week. And if you go onto YouTube and put Geo Poetry 2020 in, there's a, an eight hour day of uh, geologists and geo poets sharing their work. So that's a, another good place to start. The Scottish Centre for Geo Poet, Poetry um, has got lots and lots of information on it, as has the International Centre for Geo Poetics. Uh, Don McKay is a brilliant Canadian writer. Alison Hallett is a really brilliant uh, poet who deals with similar things. Um, Tim Creswell, who's a, who's a poet and a geographer, so really touches on both sides with kind of with precision and, and proper experimentation as well. Uh, his recent collection, Plastiglomerate is very very good um uh, th those are the names that i'm looking at at the moment anyway um and it's i think you, you sort of have to tread a little bit carefully because geopoetics are a distinctive way of looking at the world in many ways there is there is much of philosophy as they are a uh, an approach to writing um so some kind of go down uh, a little bit too far into the eco poetry and it becomes something else i'm not saying that eco poetry is better or worse than geo poetry but it, it's different is all i'm saying so yeah hopefully that's helped okay thank you anna um this one's from kath have you found any geological language within the black country dialect words that have made more sense as you've explored the areas, geopoetics? That's a really good question. I'm really sorry to have to say no. Um, I wish I had. Um, I mean, I, I guess the, the only one that springs to mind is Bibble, which is a pebble in black dialect um 
Oh, but you can you can find little black uh bubbled bits of rock that are old bits of clinker basically uh and i don't know whether there's a kind of geological meaning to it or anything but there does seem to be something quite beautifully poetic and a able to be this sort of bubbled looking burnt rock but i will start looking now that you've asked me <laughs> okay thanks kath uh this one from helen davis fascinating ideas rob and loved the poems could you say a bit more about the potential connections between queerness and excavation digging in the context of the black country possible connections between what sorry the between queerness and excavation digging in the context of the black country queerness did you say yeah okay cool so i mean for those that are listening um that don't know that connection it, it, it making reference here to my novel bella uh which is uh in many ways a queer novel uh, or a novel that explores queer identity in many ways um so it's and and the characters in that story seek out these unusual off-kilter liminal spaces to uh as these kind of arenas of subversion and arenas of transgression um and I think in lots of ways that kind of connects with the the kind of the gothic traditions of the sublime and the gothic traditions of uh the liminal as well because it's always on the edges of of a town of a of a region or or, or an area where um the hauntings take place but also where uh boundaries are allowed to be crossed in a sort of carnival sense as well as a sort of farewell to the flesh kind of sense um so uh although the geo poetry is moving in a very different direction to this it's got much less to do with um identity politics in that way um it's uh it, it does still seem to hold true that these are sites of well i'm very interested in these places in part because they are on one hand places where people go for picnics and bike rides and whatnot but also places of drug use and litter and graffiti uh and where people will run around you places that people will use to run away from things uh and authority so I guess they they have that same clandestine quality that uh, much of the queer community look for as well, or have looked for at least. Okay, thanks, Helen. Uh, this one from Kerry again. Uh, Nick Papadimitriou talks about the place where he lives and writes about down south called Scarp. And he says, I came to understand that in some respects, Scarp was a fiction. How much do you agree that the black country might be considered a fiction? Good question. Yeah. Um, for those who haven't seen that as well and and and, and looked into uh Papa, I can't pronounce his name. Um I don't want to embarrass myself. Uh ha have have a look into these ideas of psychogeography for, for those that haven't heard of it before. And um a particularly good film is the London Perambulator which mentions this chap that Kerry's just brought up. Um, I, I, I'm kind of halfway in between that statement, I think, Kerry. Um, I think in many ways, the black country is an imagined space and an imagined culture. Uh, and, and like you've said at previous things uh, and written in various guises as well, it's, um, uh it's as much a state of mind as it is a physical place so that there's an element of truth to it but i don't know i mean 
with Will Self and Sinclair and and all that psycho deep topography psychogeography uh, gang. Um, there's a there's an element of kind of postmodern pretentiousness about it as well because you know there are people that live here and have lived here and definitely still live here and you know communities and cultures that are objectively uh can be seen so it's not just a these places aren't just a figment of our imaginations or, or stories as well although they're made from them Okay, thanks, Kerry. This one is from Tilly. Do you feel that your connection with the Black Country and your poetry allows you to engage readers who may not be as familiar with the places, um, or is your main intended audience those who are already familiar? Um, I would, I, I would like to. Um, I don't know. I don't know what my intended audience is. It's a really good question, Tilly. Um, I like. I would one of my aims, I guess, as a writer is that people start to see the black country for more than its stereotype, for more than just this like backwards but slightly pleasant uh non place that you know where nothing really happens um and thanks to people like Liz Berry and Kerry Hadley Price and Mira Sayal and Roy McFarlane, you know that's there's that's definitely been taken off in the last sort of 15 years, I'd say 15, 20, 15 years or so. Uh, people like Anthony Cartwright as well have really started to kind of showcase what a kind of rich culture we've got. Um, so there's an element that I want other people to see that, but I'm also aware and very happy for people that are just very passionate about the black country like I am to read and enjoy and find interest in as well. Okay, thanks Tilly. Um, this one's from Josie Ann. Kenneth White, the Scottish poet, eventually travelled around the world to extend his geopoetics beyond his own land. Do you think you could extend your work to other parts of the world? Wow, yeah, I mean, I think it would be very interesting. Um, and yeah, I, his journey has been very, very interesting. Um, I mean, I've managed to use very similar processes and kind of poetics and creative processes in other parts of my work as well. I mean, last year I had the good fortune of being the David Bradshaw writer in residence for the University of Oxford. Though not using very similar method um, of uh, walking my way into places and getting deliberately getting lost in places. Uh, so it definitely works in places that are outside of the black country and also works in places that are not necessarily as industrial or post-industrial either. Um, likewise, I spend quite a lot of time down in Somerset these days as well. Um, uh, down in Burnham, uh, my parent-in-law, uh, my parent-in-laws have got a caravan down there, so it's free holidays. Um, and again, I'm, I'm very interested in the geology and the kind of old fishing uh, heritage as well as the sort of, because uh, it look, Burnham looks right out over uh, Hinkley uh, Power Station as well. So it's got that kind of new uh, great big power station uh, modernity about it as well. Um, so I would be very keen on spreading my wings further. Um, I see quite a lot of connections between the black country and places like Teesside, uh, some of the smaller areas outside of Leeds and, and Yorkshire, um, uh, as well as places like Salford as well. So I, I, I think I could kind of extend it that way. I don't know enough about the rest of the world, unfortunately, to be able to say I'd be as successful as Kenneth White. But what's an interesting note is really Kenneth White really he always said this you've got to start right from your own doorstep so even though he's been around the globe he started on the atlantic coast in scotland and clyde bank and glasgow and as he said in in kind of interviews and things he, he took concentric circles that just started to get bigger and bigger um 
So maybe that's the way to do it. Okay, this is a comment from Jazzy Ann. Rob as the nomadic poet. Cheers, Rob. <laughs> um, so yeah. no, I think he said something like nomadic super intellectuals or something like that. <laughs> Um, a few thank yous here. Um, thank you from, from Daisy and from Nina Lewis. Um, Kerry Hadley Price says, I like the other dimension. Thanks, Rob. And that concludes the questions. Oh. Lovely. Well, that takes us to one minute past seven. So we timed that perfectly. Well done, us. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> I really hope you enjoyed it. Great, thanks Rob. Um, I mean, a massive thanks for delivering a really interesting workshop and for reading some of your poems. I mean, stratigraphic time, stratigraphic, what a great word. Hope you all enjoyed that at home. As Rob said, do get in touch with him at r.francis at wlv.ac.uk. Um, our next Arts Fest Online event will be Tuesday the 27th of October with Dr Louise Fenton. And this will be a Halloween talk on the haunted and cursed dolls in Gravefriars Bothy, and that can be booked via Eventbrite, so that should be pretty interesting. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you all soon. Bye. I would like to make a public thank you to Claire as well, who, who does oh, these things like an absolute you. monumental, brilliant person. <laughs> Running out of words now, you can tell my brain's getting tired. But <laughs> you're absolutely amazing, Claire, and we all know it. Oh, thanks, Rob, I really appreciate that. Thank you. I'll, I'll pay you later for saying that. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. All right. Bye bye.